The Lord lives, blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of my salvation, the God who gave me vengeance and subdued peoples under me, who delivered me from my enemies. Yes, you exalted me above those who rose against me. You rescued me from the man of violence. For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations, and sing to your name great salvation he brings to his king and show steadfast love to his anointed. God, you are great and awesome and worthy to be praised. And we want to be a people who not only acknowledge your presence, we want to be a people who honor that presence. And God, we acknowledge that through the presence of your Holy Spirit in us and surrounding us, we honor you today. And God, we need you so that our mind and hearts, attentions and affections would be fixated upon Jesus. The one who should be the center of attention today and the center of attention always. But God, we confess we are so distracted by so many cares of our lives in this world, so we need your gentle prodding once again to Open eyes to see your beauty, open ears to hear your voice, and open hearts to be humble, receptive, soft, so that we might love you more because of today. And God, we bless the Hodges family as they obey your call to go and make disciples in Thailand. We pray for continual comfort in this nation as they suffer yet another tragedy with the many lives lost at the concert over the weekend. We ask that you would comfort those who grieve and mourn. And we continually pray for a purging, a refining, and a revival for this nation and its integrity in all areas of governments, in the churches, in the families. And Lord, we continue to pray and intercede for your mercy and grace to bring an end to the Ebola virus that is spreading. That it would not just be contained, but God, that you would bring healing and a cure through your wisdom and grace. We pray for an end to all the terrorist plots of ISIS and other evil groups around this world. We ask that all their plans would come to nothing in Jesus' name. And God, that these groups as well would come to a saving faith of Jesus Christ. We pray that their salvation would also start making the headlines around the world. And that they too would bring glory to the name of Christ. And we pray that also for the hearts in this place today. That we would bring glory to Christ. So God, fill me with your spirit now. Anoint me, empower me, preach through me so that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts would be pleasing and honorable in your sights. O Lord, our rock, our redeemer, our savior. It is in your precious name we pray. Amen. You know, one of the things about meeting people who love Jesus and who love the things of his heart is that you walk away from encountering them wanting to love Jesus a little bit more as well. I had the privilege of experiencing that last weekend. Thank you for your prayers as I was in Japan uh, for some speaking engagements. And I think, Lord willing, that will be my last time away from OEM until uh, the end of the year. Uh, So we will hopefully finish this first Peter series by mid-December. 
Um, and as I was in Japan, I met a pastor who oversaw a church in Kyoto, which is one of the oldest cities in that nation. His name was Pastor Tomo, and uh, his appearance was very cool looking, and I found out later there's a reason why, is because his ancestors were samurai warriors. And when he told us that, uh, I, Pastor Joel and I, we were together, we looked at each other and said, we are not surprised. He just has something about him that says, I am cool, you know, <laughs> and that my ancestors are samurais. You know, just something about that. You're like, you just knew something was very cool about this guy. And, uh, but what was even more cool is that he had a deep heart for the lost. He loved people who uh, did not know Christ yet, and he loved getting to know them and sharing the gospel with them, so much so that uh, when he learned evangelism explosion, uh, he gained a new passion for that. He translated the course into Japanese, and he became now the director of EE, Evangelism Explosion, for Japan. And um, through this ministry... Just this year, from January to September, uh, they were a, their church was able to bring about 120 Japanese to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, you have to understand, for Japan, nicknamed the graveyard of missions work because of how rare it is for people to come to know Christ, where people spend decades or their whole lifetime without ever seeing one person come to faith in Christ, that was unheard of, this is unprecedented, it is phenomenal. And it showed me that, man, God's doing something new in Japan. Amen? And so we need to continue to pray and intercede for Japan. And uh, when I, you know, wrote this on Facebook and I told people about the fruit of his labor, I got replies from Japanese friends. And they're like, Eddie, no offense, but I find that hard to believe. Uh, because they know how hard it is for the Japanese to come to faith in Christ. And I probably would have been a little bit doubtful too, unless I actually went there. And for all the events that we had for church on Sundays and for the uh, justice uh, lecture conference that we had on Monday at one, this very uh, old, old university, I kept meeting people who were a fruit of their ministry. I'd meet one person, he says, hey, I just became a Christian last month. I just became a Christian three months ago. I just became a Christian in May. I just became, like all of these people I kept meeting who just became believers and were so excited about their faith journey. And so when I would talk to Pastor Tomo, you know, I had such a burning joy in my heart because I understood that. Because when I learned Evangelism Explosion when I was in high school too, that changed my life as well. I started sharing the gospel as well and we share that common love and bond for seeing people come to know Christ. So I was so blessed by that. And I wanted, I walked away from my time in Japan also with a renewed reminder of the joy of bringing people to Christ. But as, as amazing as that was, what made me see Christ in Pastor Tomo even more was the way that he dealt with difficulties in his life, especially difficulties because of people who hurt him. You know, there's something about pain that impacts our lives like nothing else can. You know, it is through trusting in Christ, through our trials, that can transform us in ways that nothing else can. And Pastor Tomo was a testimony of this. And I'll share a little bit more of his story later on. But for today, I want us to focus on how we can look more like Jesus, especially as we go through difficulties in our lives, and especially difficulties with other people. All right, so we want to look at that. How can we grow in the image of Christ, especially through these seasons of pain? We'll explore that today. Uh, so turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. We'll be looking at verses 11 and following as we continue our study through uh, Peter's first letter. As I mentioned, Lord willing, we hope to conclude this series uh, by December, before Christmas season. So follow along with me in your uh, outline and in your Bibles as well. And so what does it look like for us to become more like Jesus? Well, for one thing, it means that we are to live a life that shines. So everyone repeat, live a life that shines. All right, so let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2, starting from verse 11. It says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. All right, so he begins here by saying, Beloved, my, my brothers and sisters that I love, I love you. He says, I urge you 
as sojourners and exiles. He begins by reminding them who they really are as sojourners, exiles, foreigners, aliens on a journey home. He's saying, remember that this world that we live in, in its present form, is not our final dwelling place. That this is not our home. And this should be encouraging for those who suffer and for those who have sacrificed for the name of Christ. To the missionaries and even to the expats, we understand what that feels like. Those who are far away from home, especially during the holidays, because of your calling to Christ. Missing out on seeing loved ones grow up. Missing out on family get-togethers. Missing out on key life moments for your younger brothers and sisters. You feel like you're missing out on so many key moments. But remember, you are not home yet. That the joy that we have, the promise that we have in Christ, is that we will have all of eternity to catch up with our loved ones. On all of life's journeys, stories, and testimonies, we'll be able to catch up with the people that we love in the presence of Jesus for all of eternity. Amen? That's one of the joys that we have. But also for those who are suffering from a dark season of life, when life is almost unbearable to go on, It is good to know that this is not the final dwelling place for us. Therefore, what Peter is saying, so he's he's setting the stage, the context for his next challenge. So he says, brothers and sisters, I love you. Remember, though, that we are foreigners and sojourners and aliens. We're not home yet. Remember this. Don't get too attached right now. Why? He says, therefore, because we are foreigners, On a journey home, he says, therefore, don't give in to the desires of the flesh and the logic of this world. Look at verse 11 again. So, beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to what? To abstain from the passions of your flesh, which wage war against your soul. Because we can become so easily self-focused when we suffer. When we go through a hard time, when we're in pain, it is so easy to begin our pity parties, right? No one likes me, right? I'm all alone. No one cares. Nobody cares about me anymore. And so often we go through this pity party when we suffer. But he's warning us when that happens. Because there is a danger in that mentality. When we become self-focused in our pity parties, that mentality leads people into compromise and sin. In that state of mind, we are tempted to comfort ourselves by compromising in sin. That I deserve this. No one will know. I have the right to do this. Everybody does it. Why should not? I know far too many missionaries who ended up falling morally on the mission field because of their seasons of isolation or loneliness or suffering. When we think that this temporary pain is the ultimate reality, we lose proper perspective on what really matters. So that is why Peter reminds us that your pain is not permanent. So remember this. In Christ, and because of Christ, our seasons of pain are not permanent. Amen? Your frustrations will not last forever. Your betrayals will be dealt with properly one day. But for now, this is not your final destination. But for now, we must fight against these sins that wage war against our souls. The temptations that lure us will make us weak and ineffective for Christian mission. You see, the choices that we make when we suffer, it magnifies our true spiritual condition. The choices that you make when you suffer, it magnifies whether we are controlled by the Spirit or controlled by the flesh, more than at any other time in our lives. Because when things are smooth, when things are nice, 
We might make change, choices that are good just because we don't feel bad. We might make choices that are bad or unwise, but we're, we're just thinking, no big deal. Life is good. You win some, you lose some. I make mistakes, sometimes I don't. But when you suffer and you go into self-focused pity party mode, the choices that you make will magnify if you are spirit-led or flesh-led. Because those choices reveal who we trust in and who we turn to for comfort. Do we trust in ourselves, our methods, our control, or do we trust in God? Will we deal with things my way, through the wisdom and the way of the world, or through the ways that God has given us guidance for? You see, one way that this kind of self-focused comfort, giving into the flesh, when we are going through hard times, manifest in this generation, like no other, is through pornography. We are at all-time highs in pornographic addictions today because of how easily accessible it is through our smartphones and the Internet, the generation that we live in. Time magazine reported this past May of a German study that found viewing pornography actually changes both the chemical and the physical makeup of our brain. So you f your brain will physically change through viewing pornography. In fact, it also changes the way people think because the part of the brain associated with processing and evaluating cost and reward that part of the brain shrinks and gets smaller when you view pornography. So the inability to really wait, is this a wise choice to make or not? That process for us to weigh rewards and costs, that actually gets stunted and hindered through the view of pornography. And so what they also found in another study, the fruit of that because they can't weigh things properly as to whether it's good or not, it, leads to an, it led to, in the study that they were doing, an increased amount of violent thoughts and violent activity, especially, these men who viewed porn, especially against women and children. So it reveals a danger of when we all of a sudden want to comfort ourselves and therefore pamper ourselves by satisfying the cravings of our flesh, the danger that is there. But another danger side effect that Peter is making reference to here is that porn or satisfying the desires of the flesh that will kill your passion for Christ. So many in this generation, they will turn to porn as a release in their stressful state, but that will do greater damage to your soul in the end. So instead of giving in to the passions of our flesh, what are we, when we are struggling, what does Peter call us to do? Look at verse 12. He says, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So we are to live a life of integrity, not just in private, that's the ultimate place of integrity, but also before people who treat you poorly. People who actually do speak evil against you. We are to live a life that shines, a life of integrity, a life of love, a life of grace, a life of Christ in the secret place of our lives, yes, and also in the difficult relationships within our lives. Especially to people who do not know the Lord, but also to people who do know the Lord and hurt you more than people who don't know the Lord. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Unfortunately, I think we can all testify that so, sometimes Christians hurt us even more than non-Christians. Uh, so he is speaking to us who have gone through that kind of pain. Our lives are to declare the gospel, but also demonstrate the gospel. Look at that verse again, verse 12. So that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. The day of visitation is a reference to the return of Christ. And so when we live a life of the gospel in response to the evil done to us, that will serve as a witness 
and in the end it will glorify God. Someone once said there are two key reasons why people don't go to church. Number one, they don't know a Christian. Number two, they do know a Christian. Our lifestyle also functions as a witness to a watching world around us. And I think Peter, when he was writing this verse, was probably also thinking of the words of Jesus in Matthew 5.16 because it's very similar language is used. He says, In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So there is a way that our gospel living needs to be a demonstration of the gospel as well as a declaration. It must be a visible witness as well as a verbal witness. So Pastor Tomo that I mentioned earlier from Japan, I was really blessed by him uh, during our fellowship time together. Um, and he shared this that was really painful within his life. Several years ago, he was pastoring in another city at a different church. And he came across, when he started pastoring this church, a lot of shady and illegal activity happening with money that people were um, you know, lending money even amongst church members uh, in order to get them in debt or charging crazy high interest rates and doing all this other very shady stuff that Christians should not be involved with, especially with each other. He knew it was wrong, and so he decided, and it was such a big part of the culture, he decided he needed to preach on the biblical view of money. And so obviously he didn't call out people by name or whatever, but he was just sharing from the Bible uh, God's view of money, how it should be stewarded, how we need to use it well, bless others who are in need with it, be generous, all this stuff like that. And uh, the people who were involved in the shady activity, they began hating him because of this sermon series. They would slander him, speak falsely, spread rumors, all this stuff. And this was a big one that shocked me. He said that, uh, you know, many, many years ago, uh, you know, before the days of Facebook and even Friendster, uh, you know, there were other blog sites that were free, right? Uh, shows how dated we are, right? Uh, and so he was talking about how back then he used to blog about just devotional thoughts that he had, whatever he kept that. And then as, again, new sites come on, you just forget about the old one and you move on to new ones. So this old, old site that he used to use many, many years ago, um, again, it was free, and as you also know, when there are free sites, there's also a lot of advertisements. So what some people in this group that was out to get him did is they, you know, they, they tried to find anything possible to just try to ruin his name. And so they found his old blog. But the thing is, they also found that every time they would open it, different advertisements would pop up. And so they kept clicking and waited until some very strange advertisement showed up, like, you know, women in very scantily clad clothes, and they f took freeze frame shots of it, and they began spreading rumors, like he used to post about pornography and posted pictures of naked ladies and all just crazy stuff. And it got so bad that eventually they forced him out of the church. And it's very heartbreaking to hear this story. And obviously he was very hurt by those actions. But the thing that really blessed me during our conversations, just spending time with him, obviously he was deeply hurt, but he was not bitter at them, that he still loved them, he still prayed for them, he still prayed for the church. He wanted to see repentance, he wanted to see restoration, he wanted to see revival within those people. And I was so amazed at how much he looked like Jesus to me as he was sharing his heart for the people who hurt him so bad. And then I would ask him, why, you know, why, why, why do you have this attitude? And he said, because he knew that on the day of judgments, everyone will be held accountable for what they did in that situation. He wanted to make sure that in his heart and in his life, that that would shine on the day when Jesus reveals the truth of what really happened. Because he asked, because whose actions will really bring glory to God in the end? On that great day of judgment, I could assure you this pastor will be honored and those people will be humbled because on Judgment Day we will face honor or deep humbling. Our lifestyle will be used by God to shine light into darkness, to draw people to God and to bring glory to God in the end. Amen? So that's uh, an important thing for us to know, to live a life that shines, whether it's in private, public, in front of people who are believers, in front of people who are not, to keep living a life that will radiate the grace of Jesus. 
But another way that we are to live a life that looks like Jesus is when we live a life of submission. So everyone repeat, live a life of submission. So Peter is saying, part of living a life like Jesus is submitting our hearts to the things that God desires. How so? Specifically here. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. Let's get ready to read that together, shall we? Ready to begin? Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. Now, if you're taking notes in your handout, I'd like for you to underline the words every human institution. That's an important one for us to focus on. Because the basic biblical principle that is outlined in Scripture concerning following leaders and submitting to leaders, you need to understand this because we fail in this often. The basic biblical principle that God gives us as to how we are to deal with authority figures is that we are to obey all authority, all of our leaders, except if they ask you to sin. All right, that's the general principle. Okay. That we obey leadership, we obey authority that's put over you, except if they ask you to sin. From presidents to the police, to principals at school, to pastors in your churches, we are called by God to trust God and obey them. Hebrews 13, 17 says, point blank, obey your leaders and submit to them. Romans 13, 1, let every person be subject to governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. So he's saying trust God and obey them because it is ultimately God who has placed those leaders, bosses, and authority figures over your life. Romans 13.2 says, Therefore, whoever resists authority, whoever rebels against authority, resists and rebels against what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgments. So he's saying to rebel against them is to rebel against God. And we will be judged for those actions. You see, the reason why God has such an issue with rebellion is because rebellion is at the heart of Satan's kingdom. That is how Lucifer fell from heaven. That is how Satan tempted Adam and Eve to rebel. Uh, why did Lucifer get cast out of heaven? Because, his, because of his rebellion against God as Lord over his life. And so, rebellion is at the heart of Satan's kingdom, but at the heart of God's kingdom is submission. Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 15 and following, he says, this, for this is the will of God. This is God's will. You want, you're struggling to know God's will? Begin with this. This is God's will. Learn to support and submit to leadership that you are under. Um, for this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. So the real motive of why we must obey leaders, because we trust God, we fear God, and we want to honor God. We submit to them because we fear and honor God more than our own desires. And I'll be the first to admit, this was probably one of the hardest lessons for me to learn when I was growing up. I've been under some very weak and poor leadership the earlier years of my ministry. I've had people who are not gifted in leadership at all, and it frustrated me because I always felt like I knew better, like I could see things that you couldn't see. I rebelled, I complained, I made it very difficult for some of these leaders because I did feel like I knew better. So yes, I was a young punk back then, and I think that's why God has brought young punks into my life sometimes, uh, because you reap what you sow. Not OEM at all. Mm -mm -mm. I'm not talking about anybody on our staff, no. Of course not. You know, a long time ago. You know, other people that I knew, right? Um, anyway, where am I? Yes. <laughs> Punks, yes. Punks, let's pray. Again. No, okay. Um, and for one particular leader in, in general, he was very, he clearly, he was not gifted in leadership. Uh, I would often try to give very subtle hints to him, you know, uh, by giving him a book on leadership every chance I got. 
his birthday, anniversary, Korean Chuseok, Lunar New Year, the regular New Year. Like, I bombarded him with books on leadership, but he would always reply, Oh, thank you, Eddie, but I already have this book. And I'd stare at him like, Did you read it? And he would reply, Yes. I'd slowly walk back into my office, and I'd be like, No, you didn't! You did not read it, because if you read it, you would not be doing this. So I was a punk back then, yes. But as I was constantly having this very rebellious heart, the Spirit of God really convicted my heart one day with these verses on leadership and submission. These verses on submission really changed my perspective on some things. And I felt God, the Spirit of God clearly telling me, Eddie, I did not call you to submit only to perfect leadership because in this world you're not going to find it. And then the Spirit was saying to me, it's not about, the question is not, do they deserve my submission or supports? But the question that we have to ask ourselves is, do I trust Jesus? Because submitting to Him was ultimately honoring Jesus. That God would use that submission to form Christ in me. Why? Because Christ also submitted himself to Caesar, to governors, to pay taxes. He submitted himself unto death. We are becoming like Jesus when we do this because to follow, even when your flesh doesn't feel like it, is walking the road of Calvary. That is following in the footsteps of Jesus. To follow our leader, even when our flesh is against it, is keeping us in step with our true leader, Jesus Christ. He walked the road of self-denial. He walked the road of submission to the cross unto death. Amen. And there's one more important thing that we need to learn about living a life that looks like Jesus. It is when we live a life of surrender. So everyone repeat, live a life of surrender. 1 Peter 2, starting from verse 18, it says, Servants, now he's getting even more specific to household servants, Servants, be subject, submit to, support your earthly masters with all respects. Now get this. This is the hard part not only to the good and gentle bosses, but also to the unjust bosses. What? Verse 19. For this is grace. This is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, the reason why you do it is God. It's not because they deserve it. It's not because they're perfect. It's not because their personality is enjoyable to be with. Because you're mindful of God. Because you trust God. You want to honor God. You fear God. One endures sorrows, sufferings, sadness, disappointments, hardships, while suffering unjustly. It's not fair. That's not right. I don't deserve this. I have rights. Verse 20, for what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? It's like big deal. You rebel, you sin, and you get punished for a big deal. But if when you do good and you suffer for it and you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. In our times of suffering, we must learn to surrender Surrender our sins, yes. Surrender to our Savior, yes. But also surrender our rights. Surrender our own agendas. So that God can have His way in us. Because believe it or not, every plan of your life probably doesn't match with the plans of God. And when He intercepts and interjects, and in our view, interferes, our way and our plan may be God's trying to do something greater in your life 
than fulfill the plan that you initially had. God will allow us to experience unfair treatment and even injustice so that we will get a taste of what Jesus went through for us. Our perfect, innocent Savior going through literally hell on earth and taking our hell in eternity so that we could be with Him and so that we could become like Him. But it's more than that. It's more than just so that we could taste what Jesus went through for us. It is God's ultimate way to make us like Jesus in the process. When we demand our own way, when we demand our own rights, we are short-circuiting God's path of conforming us into the image of Christ. So when that injustice happens, when we are betrayed, we learn to take it in and trust the Lord. We learn to stay low and grow. We learn to trust and obey. We learn to surrender to God and let God shape Christ in us. Verse 21. For to this you have been called. God is calling you to this lifestyle of following after Christ, of carrying your cross, of walking the road of Calvary. To this you have been called. Why? Because Christ also suffered for you leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in, its, in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued, what? Entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. A life-changing truth that you need to know. All right? Now, if you are able to understand this principle and apply it in your life, it's going to change everything for you. A life-changing truth that you need to know is that everything that comes into your life has as one of its primary purposes to refine you and make you more like Christ. Especially difficult circumstances. Especially suffering. That everything that comes from the wise and sovereign hand of God that God has allowed to enter our lives instead of us becoming bitter because our way is not happening, it is an opportunity for us to become more like Christ in our responses to difficult people, through disappointing situations. If you understand this truth, Every moment of your life will take on eternal significance. This moment, this season of your life, it is an opportunity to trust Jesus and to let God shape you into the image of Jesus. So when that person hurts you, how you respond can bring great glory to God and make you more like his son. Look at verse 23 again. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When they spewed insults at him, he did not respond with insults back. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. When you surrender your rights and trust in Jesus, Christ is formed in you. I know surrendering to Jesus can be scary, right? But it is part of our journey into glory that will never leave you the same again. You know, I shared a couple of weeks ago about my friends that I met in Boston, Walter and Tony. Uh, they studied at Harvard, Yale. They had a daughter with Down syndrome named Naomi. 
We graduated Regent College together. After I graduated, uh, I went to Korea and I started my international year in Korea, Australia, Korea. They went to Boston and stayed in Boston for almost 16 years. Um, while we were having dinner, he shared with me that a big reason why they stayed in Boston for these past 16 years uh, is because of the medical attention and the special needs for their daughter, Naomi. And so, uh, now Walter is a phenomenal preacher, pastor, leader, scholar. I mean, he's, he's always been the top of his class, always been elected to be the leader of every group that he's been a part of. Phenomenal guy in the academic world and in the evangelical world. Uh, he was a leader in Campus Crusade for Christ. He has been and always, um, always was uh, a leader that people took notice of. And so because of that, uh, as he lived in Boston, he would start getting offers to lead very significant ministries, churches, and organizations around the world, throughout the U.S., but he always told them no. So at first it was very easy. He says, no, because of my daughter's special needs, I need to stay in Boston. Uh, but as the years went by, more and more incredible opportunities were offered to him, and he kept denying them. But later on, he would share that he couldn't start help to start feel the pain of what if in his heart. The what if started entering his mind. What if he took that position leading that phenomenal ministry that's impacting tens of thousands in that city? What if he took that organization that's impacting the world for the gospel? What if he hadn't said no to these things? Where would his life be today? But in the end, he knew a true sacrifice for love is never really a sacrifice in the end because in the end, what you gain is far greater than anything you had to give up. But you know, as he was telling me the story, and even as he was telling me the struggles that he had of doubting and wondering what could have been, I couldn't help but think of the story that Jesus speaks of, of how the woman broke the expensive perfume, the alabaster jar at his feet. And people around them were saying, what a waste. Very expensive perfume, wasted in the sight of man, but worship in the sight of God. Every sacrifice, every act of surrender that is done because of our trust in Jesus and because of our desire to honor Him is never wasted. For moms who give up the prime years of your life to care for your children, those are not wasted years. That is worship before the throne of God. And to young families with young babies, giving up comfortable suburban lifestyles in the U.S. or Australia to go to one of the poorest parts of Thailand in order to reach these people with the gospel, that is not a waste. That is worship in the eyes of heaven. Amen? You know, Bill Hybels, he's the pastor of Willow Creek Church in Chicago. Um, my parents attended that when I was in Chicago, and I would attend uh, often when I would visit. And uh, he would often share stories about how people in his church uh, would be offered um, promotions, but they would have to move to other cities. And he would talk about how multiple families in their congregation would give up these promotions in other cities and other states and other countries because of how much the ministry was flourishing the faith of their children. And they didn't want to take that away from them. And so these guys would share about how they would be condemned, criticized as foolish in the eyes of even their bosses because they would explain why they're turning down this promotion. But then Pastor Bill Hybels would tell them, that is not foolishness. That is foolishness in the eyes of the world. But that is wisdom in the eyes of God. That their priorities is not about making a greater profit in the bank account. Their profit is greater in investing into the spiritual nourishment of their children. What is a waste in the eyes of the world oftentimes is worship in the eyes of God. Nothing surrender out of love for Jesus is ever a waste. Nothing. 
Therefore, pour out your life gladly and generously as a sacrifice for Jesus. Live boldly and courageously for his kingdom. Give generously and anonymously in the service of those who are in need. And above all else, trust him through every trial, under every form of leadership. Trust the true leader of our souls, Jesus Christ. And in following him, trusting him, we become like Him and bring glory to Him in the end. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank You for Your amazing grace and patience towards us. God, we want to confess that there are so many times that we do harbor a spirit of rebellion against imperfect leaders and imperfect people and very awkward and difficult situations in our lives. But God, we thank you for your kindness and your rebuke today. That in kindness, you lead us to repentance. God, we pray that you would uproot that spirit of bitterness and spirit of rebellion in our hearts so that we would have a tender, soft, humble heart like Jesus that trusts in you and that follows you even on the road of Calvary. So God, teach us to trust you even when it means dying to something of our own plans and dreams that we will trust you we will hold on to you and we will follow you all the days of our lives now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory without faults but with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, power, praise, and authority before all time. Be exalted, be trusted now and forever. Amen.